Hey everybody, this is Russ from Retro Game Core. Before we get started with today's video, let's do a quick walk down memory lane. Now, back in 2005, I got the original PSP, and man, I loved that thing. I actually bought it on launch day, and it was my first dedicated handheld that I had ever bought. I remember picking up some launch titles like Luminous as well as Wipeout, and man, I played the heck out of those games. Now, flash forward about six months, I started hearing about this thing called Homebrew, and that you could jailbreak the device and start playing ROMs on it. And yeah, sure enough, I was one of those early adopters and I tried to jailbreak my PSP. I got it working for the most part. I actually don't even remember what method I used. It was so long ago. But the one thing I'll never forget is the fact that I actually bricked my PSP and so I no longer have it and it no longer works. But all told, I would say that was my first kind of entry into the emulation scene. Now I didn't really get into emulation again until way later, like back in 2020. But all told, I have these very warm, nostalgic feelings about the PSP, and so you can imagine my surprise when I pulled this thing out of a box just a couple days ago. And this here is the new GPD Win 4. This is actually rocking the same Ryzen 6800U chipset that we've seen in some other handheld devices released over the past few months. But there are a couple things that make this one unique. For example, it is quite thick. As you can see right here, it's well over an inch in thickness. And that's actually to accommodate another feature that is pretty cool and that it has a slide out keyboard. Just look at that, it's pretty cool. And of course we have this beautiful PSP form factor as well. Man, I really do love the design of this thing. But of course design is only one aspect when it comes to a mini PC. And so we're gonna run it through a gamut in this video here. My plan is to test it out when it comes to PC gaming as well as emulation and to see how it stacks up against the competition. Now, before we jump into the meat of the video, I do want to give a shout out to my buddy, The Fox, because this is actually his review unit, but he offered to send it over to me as a loner so I could do a video and then send it back. And so that was really cool of him to offer. And so yeah, shout out to Fox for actually setting that up. If you're not familiar with his channel, he goes really in depth when it comes to mini PCs, specifically when it comes to getting the best performance with the best battery life. And so if you could do me a favor and go to his channel, check it out. And if you like it, maybe hit that subscribe button too. I think 2023 is the year where he's really gonna break out and get over 100,000 subscribers. Either way, I'm super excited to test out the GPD Win 4. And so without any further delay, let's jump into it. Okay, to start, I've heard a lot of people saying that this is more like an upgraded PS Vita, but I disagree. I think it's more like a PSP. As you can see here, compared to a 3000 model PSP, it just has a lot of the same shape. In particular, if you look at the little lanyard loop that they have on the bottom left, as well as the shoulder buttons, to me, it's a dead ringer. Now, there are obviously some similarities with the PS Vita as well. As you can see here, we have the D-pad and the face buttons, which are very similar. At the end of the day, I would say that Sony still has a pretty good copyright case against them, regardless if we're talking about a PSP or a PS Vita knockoff. But for me personally, I think it looks more like a PSP. Now with that out of the way, let's talk about some specs. Now, like I mentioned, this is running the 6800U chipset. This means it has eight cores and 16 threads and a base clock of 2.7 gigahertz, but can be boosted up to 4.7. Now, if you've seen other reviews with this chipset, you probably know already that it has that Zen 3 Plus architecture and it has about 25, maybe 30% better performance than the Steam Deck. Now, this also takes LPDDR5 RAM and it can get spec'd either 16 or 32 gigs depending on the model you grab. Additionally, it has a 2280 M.2 slot capable of PCIe 4.0. And depending on the model you get, it'll come with as low as 512 gigs of storage or two terabytes. Now we're looking at a 45 watt hour battery. That's about 12% larger than what you can find on the Steam Deck. In terms of display, we're looking at six inches with a 1080p resolution. This is a 16 by nine aspect ratio and it's not OLED. This is an LCD panel, but it is nice and bright and sharp. And we'll talk more about the features as we kind of kick the tires and go around the actual device itself, but it does have Wi-Fi 6, Bluetooth 5.2, and a micro SD card slot. Additionally, one of the two USB-C ports is capable of USB 4, which means that you can plug it into an external GPU. In terms of pricing, we're at the tail end of an Indiegogo campaign right now, so we only have a couple days left on this, but the lowest price model that they have right here is $799. And that is cheaper than any of the other 6800U models that are out right now, and so that's pretty awesome. But bear in mind that it is going to go up to $950 after the campaign ends, which is going to be just about the same as many of the other 6800U devices. And so it is a great deal and discount right now, but that's only going to last for about two days after publishing this video. And so to start, let's go ahead and take a look at the device itself and get some impressions just in the hand. First impression here is that I really like the build quality. It feels really solid in the hands and I also like the plastic they're using too. Second impression is that this is a very thick handheld. Look at how thick that is right here. 
Now, of course, that is to accommodate the slide out keyboard, but all the same, yes, this is a pretty hefty device. Now, if I had to use one word to describe it, I think it would be dense. This thing is like a brick of a computer. And for me personally, I was surprised to find that I actually liked that feel. Like it felt really dense, like I was holding something that was of great value. But all the same, this thing is about 600 grams, so about a pound and a quarter. And so because of that, it is pretty heavy. Like I wouldn't want to hold it up over my head while laying down. Okay, now let's take a look at the star of the show, which is this slide out keyboard here. This is my first time using a device with a keyboard like this, and I gotta say, I ended up loving this experience. To start, the keyboard is backlit, which is a nice bonus, and then also it just slides really well. It's definitely something you have to do deliberately, it's not something that'll happen accidentally, and it's still really kind of firm in the shell like you can see. And so there's like a tiny bit of wobble here if you really push it, but at the end of the day, in just regular use, you won't notice it at all. It feels very sturdy. Now the keys themselves are very flat, there's no bump out of the shell or anything else like that, and so it's not something that you could like comfortably type on like I wouldn't want to write a paper on this but all the same it really does work out in a pinch. The keys themselves have a soft clickiness to them and it feels a lot like an old cell phone and I kind of like that too. Either way yes I thought this was going to be a gimmick when I first got the device but it turns out that I used it way more than I thought I would. Another thing I found really helpful is this little mouse pad here on the right. Now initially when I heard about this I thought it was going to be like a little nub like you would find on an old ThinkPad or some of the newer 3DS models. But it turns out this is an optical mouse pad. I've never used one of these before, but basically when you move your finger around, it also moves the cursor too. And so it does take a little bit of time to get used to because it is very sensitive, but once you have it down, it is pretty amazing. And so long story short, yes, I ended up being a fan of the keyboard mouse. In fact, it's one of the reasons why I like this device so much. But now let's move over to the other buttons that we have available. We'll start with the D-pad. Now this is very similar to a PS Vita's D-pad like I showed earlier in the demonstration between the two. But if anything, I would say that this one's a little bit tighter than a PS Vita's D-pad. It has a little bit less travel and just feels more snug like in the case itself. For a comparison, here is my PS Vita 2000 model. And as you can see here, yeah, it looks a lot looser here. I think they're both good. They have a nice soft clickiness to them and they feel really precise. But if I had to choose between the two, I think I'd prefer the Win 4 D-pad. It's a little bit more tight and precise. Now the company is no stranger to this particular D-pad. In fact, they used it on the GPD XP Plus, as you can see here. This one is also similarly tight to the one on the Win 4, but it's also a lot more elevated. In fact, I would say it's almost a little bit too elevated, especially when compared to the Win 4. I think this is just a really good D-pad. And so as far as clicky D-pads go, this is one of my favorites right now. Now next up we have the analog stick. This one's a bit of a conundrum. So for starters, I really like the size of it. I like that the stick itself is a lot larger than say something like a Joy-Con. And so it does feel a little bit smaller than a console's analog stick, but not by much. One of the nice things here is that it has a good height to it. And so because of that, it feels just a lot more comfortable than you think it would be. Now, that being said, I'm not a huge fan of the actual cap that they're using here. I'm really hoping this is like an engineering cap and then they improve it with the final model. But as it stands right now with this particular engineering model, yeah, I think the analog stick caps here need to be improved. For example, if we look at the GPD XP Plus again, you can see this one has a much larger cap to it, and I find this to be much more comfortable too. In fact, the XP Plus analog sticks are some of my favorites that are on any handheld bar none. Now that being said, I did go through my different switch caps here, and I found these from Skull & Co, and these actually fit really well. And so if they do ship with the ones that we found here in the engineering sample, I don't think it's a big deal. You can pay $8, $10 and get something much better right here. The nice thing about these is they improve the overall feel when you're actually using the analog sticks, but they also don't really get in the way of the face buttons either. And so for me, it's the best of both worlds, and the moment I figured this out, I just kind of kept them on my device. Now sticking to the left side of the device, let's look at the other options we have. So first thing you may notice is that we have some front firing speakers, more on that later. And then our menu buttons, select and start, are available here at the bottom as well. These are very clicky. Additionally down here we have a fingerprint sensor. This is supposed to allow you to unlock your Windows machine. It's not quite working on this model, but it should be working in the retail units. On the right side, we have a very similar setup here on the bottom. We've got that analog stick, the mouse pad that we've already talked about, and then a start button, which is incorrectly labeled as a select button. And like I mentioned, these are very clicky kind of micro switchy buttons here. Additionally, on the bottom, we have this menu button. It took me a while to kind of figure out what this was, but it's basically functioning as an Xbox button on this model. Additionally, we have two indicator lights here. These will light up when they're charged and they'll go green when the battery is full. And finally, let's take a look at the face buttons. These are very small and actually almost identical to those found on the PS Vita. 
These are all labeled as A, B, and X, Y, but inside the button itself, there is some labels for the actual PlayStation symbols as well. The buttons themselves have a soft clickiness to them, not a lot of travel to them, but I think it feels really good in the fingers. Again, it's very similar to what you can find on the PS Vita as well as the GPD XB+. And so I know there are people out there who don't really like small buttons like this, but when it comes to the PS Vita, I actually don't mind it at all. Now my caliper batteries are dying right now, as you can tell, and so because of that I can't really give you a measurement, but I can show you that they're at least the same size between these three models. And so it's kind of hard to anticipate whether or not you're going to actually like these buttons, but me personally, I do like them. If you have access to a PS Vita and you can touch those and get a feeling for it, then that might help. If I had to describe it, I would say they're a little bit smaller than a Joy-Con's buttons, but easier to press down on and feel more satisfying as well. Either way, even though they are small buttons, I think they fit really well with a small handheld like this. There was never a moment where I thought, man, I wish these were larger. In terms of just overall placement of the buttons and the feel in the hand, yeah, it works. You can access everything on the face very, very easily. And so in terms of just kind of holding it in general, yeah, feels good. But we've got more buttons to test. We'll go to the shoulders and triggers next. Now these shoulder buttons have the same kind of clickiness as the face buttons and D-pad, and they also have a very light travel to them. In fact, they have less travel to them than on a PS Vita. But that being said, they have that same kind of satisfying soft click. And so because of that, yeah, I like these as well. Now these shoulder buttons also light up like with RGB lighting. Now, unfortunately on my model, as I was testing it, that wasn't working, but it will be working on the retail units. Okay, now let's talk about the triggers. Now these are analog inputs and they're kind of small. It makes sense. They probably didn't want them sticking out too much from the shell itself. And to be honest, I'm not a huge fan of these triggers right here. I appreciate that they're analog, but I just think the design leaves a little bit to be desired. To start, when you press down on them, they kind of angle on a pivot directly down. And I think if the buttons were sloped, like they had a ski slope to them, they would feel a lot better in the hands. Like it would be like your fingers are almost cradled. And there's a little bit of that going on when you press down on it, but still, it just feels like they're small triggers and that they angle directly down when you press down on them. And it's not the end of the world by any means. I've seen worse triggers on other devices, but I've also seen better at the same price point. If these had triggers like this Steam Dex, I think it would be amazing. Okay, with the buttons out of the way, let's talk about the rest of the I.O. So up top here, we have the power button as well as the volume buttons here. And then up top here, we have that USB 4 port. That means we can use this to plug it directly into an external GPU, which will be really handy if you want to use this docked. And then up top, we have a USB A port. I'm always happy to see these because that means you can plug in something like a flash drive really easily. And then finally up top, we have the headphone jack and then a large port here for the heat exhaust vent. On the bottom here, we have a fully functioning USB-C port, which means it's capable of video out. And then we also have this little notch here, which I think is meant to be used with the GPD dock. On the left side, we have a micro SD card slot. Always happy to see that for the additional storage. And then also we have a toggle here to go between the joypad as well as the mouse mode. Personally, I've never actually turned this over to mouse mode because we have that little mouse nub, but you do have the option here. And finally on the right, we have a CMOS reset button. This comes in kind of handy if you mess up the settings within the BIOS, you can just reset it right here. On the back here, we have a large intake vent for the cooling fan, and I gotta say the cooling on here works pretty well. Additionally, we have two back buttons here that can be programmed however you'd like within the software. Other than that, the other comment that I wanna make here about the back is that the feel of the plastic here is really good and no smudges. I'm always happy to see when they use like a smudgeless plastic. And that also carries over to the front. It's the same sort of plastic. It feels really good in the hand. Now I'm not sure if fingerprints are gonna show up on the black model, but they're not showing up on the white model at all, which is pretty awesome. And so to wrap everything up in terms of controls and buttons here, this thing feels really good to hold in the hands. Just as I naturally hold it here, my fingers just rest on the triggers and then I can hold the rest of the device very comfortably. It really helps that it's very rounded along the edges here like it feels like a PSP. When it comes to the bumps here on the back, they're not the most ergonomic things in the world, but all the same, I think it's to keep the size of the whole device down. At the end of the day, my fingers just kind of naturally curl around the back, not so much like a grip like on the Steam Deck, and not really flat against the back like how it is on an Aya Neo 2. And so I would say thanks to the roundedness and overall thickness of the device, it does feel very comfortable to hold in the hands, a lot more than I thought it would at this kind of smaller size. It's definitely not as comfortable as a Steam Deck, but I would say it's more comfortable than something like the Aya Neo Air. And finally, let's take a look at the screen. Now, this is a nice bright screen, but as you can see, the bezels on it are fairly large, especially here on the bottom. Now, they're probably having to deal with all sorts of issues when it comes to the panel and the slide out keyboard, so I'm not sure if they could have made it any better anyway. But as it stands right now, it's just more of a nitpick than anything. I still think it looks really good. Next up, to get a feel of the overall size, let's compare it against other handhelds within the space. 
You've already seen it compared to the PSP and PS Vita, and obviously it's quite a bit bigger than those. Moving up here, here's the Nintendo Switch Lite, and as you can see, it's not that much bigger than that. Now, that being said, it's easily twice as thick, but in terms of just overall width and height, it's about the same. And that's going to be the same story as other devices of the same size, like the iNeo Air Pro, as you can see here, as well as the AYN Odin. Now, if we want to jump up to some larger devices, here's the 7-inch screen on the Logitech G Cloud, and yeah, this one's quite a bit bigger. And the Win 4 is definitely smaller than any other 6800U handheld. For example, the iNeo 2 or the iNeo Geek, which are about the same size. And same thing with the One X Player Mini Pro, also using a 6800U, and the One X Player 2, again using the same chip. And so yes, compared to all the other handheld PCs using the same 6800U chip, the Win 4 is smaller by a mile. Now, of course, no size comparison would be complete without the Steam Deck, and so here it is here. And as you can see, it's quite a bit smaller than the Steam Deck. It's almost maybe half the size. Now, like I said, despite being so small, it feels very dense and thick. After all, it is 600 grams altogether in weight. For a good comparison here, it's about 27% more heavy than the iNeo Air Pro, despite being about the same size. In fact, the Win 4 is only about 10% lighter than the much bigger iNeo 2, and same thing with the Steam Deck. It's only about 15% lighter than this one. And so it's hard to overstate just how thick and dense this thing actually feels in the hands. Again, as a comparison with that iNeo Air Pro, you can just see the size difference right here. Now, like I mentioned earlier in the video, I actually like the thickness and density of this device. It feels very premium and just kind of luxurious to hold. And surprisingly, despite the fact that it doesn't have very large grip bumps to it, it just feels more comfortable than something like the iNeo Air. And so I guess my overall point here is that yes, it is small and heavy, and I kind of like that. And I think as long as you know that going into it, you might like it as well. But if you're looking for something a little bit more lightweight, this probably isn't going to be the device for you. Okay, we spent a lot of time talking about the fit and feel of this device. Now let's move over to the software side. To start, I want to talk about Motion Assistant. This is a third-party app that's been integrated into GPD and will ship with all the devices. And within here, you can do things like adjust the gyroscopic controls, but the main thing here that I really like is that you have TDP controls as well. And so in addition to the TDP adjustments that you can do here, they also have some hotkeys set up which are really handy. And so to do this, what you do is you hold on select and then press up and it'll go up by one watt. And same thing if you press down, it'll go back down. And so you can make some fine tune adjustments to the TDP without having to be in the app at all. And I found this to be really handy when I'm trying to dial in some really optimal settings depending on the game I'm playing. Now the thing about the GPD community is it's super active when it comes to third party software like this. In fact, the Fox just showed off a video of a new tool called Auto TDP, which works with any 6800U handheld. And I'll leave a link to this video in the description below. It is fascinating stuff. That being said, it's still in a testing phase and it is a little bit hard to kind of get around with. For example, right now it doesn't have a graphical user interface. You have to type out all of the settings and you can get lost in these settings pretty easily. And so if you do have a 6800U device, even a laptop, then I would recommend checking out that video because there's some pretty cool potential here. But as it stands for this video here, I just used the Motion Assistant app that came with the device and toggled my TDP that way. Now in terms of other pre-built software on the device, there is another one called Win Controls, and this is probably a remnant to the Win 3, as you can see it has the model right here. But this is the tool you can use to adjust those two back keys. And so for example, I've set the left one to select and the right one to A. That means if I want to adjust the TDP quickly, I can just press the back button and up instead of hitting select and up. It's just a little bit more ergonomic. Either way, that's really about it when it comes to some specialized options for the GPD Win 4. If anything, I'd say they're a little bit rough around the edges, but they are very lightweight apps and they're easy to just kind of turn on and forget. Now in terms of just everyday software use, I kept it within mostly the SteamOS interface like this. But there are a couple tricks that you can do. For example, if you press select and start, you can bring up the Motion Assistant app. Or if you have the app running in the background, you can just slide up the keyboard and press Alt Tab and go between the two. And honestly, this is kind of the beauty of having a keyboard readily available as you use a handheld PC. To be able to just jump into the keyboard and do something like press the Windows button to bring up the Windows menu, or you could press Alt F4 to just close out of an app that's not working really well, all of those things are kind of hard to do in another device. But being able to slide up and toggle between, say, a web browser with your favorite website and then going back to your game, that's pretty awesome. As an example, you could bring up a walkthrough while playing a game and you could refer to that in case you get stuck. Either way, I think there's just a lot of options within handheld mode to be able to use that keyboard in ways that you can't in others. 
And so here's one other example. Say you're playing a game and it requires you to type something in. Usually on a different handheld, you have to set up a hotkey to bring up a virtual keyboard. And even then it's gonna cover up some of your screen. So sometimes you don't know what you're typing. But on the GPD Win 4, you just slide up the keyboard, start typing and bada bing, you're done. And so it's really hard to overstate just how handy it is to have this keyboard and mouse, but I found that it's one of my favorite things about the GPD Win 4 overall. And so I walked into this review a bit of a skeptic about the need to have a keyboard in the first place, and I walked away a week later being a big fan of the concept. Okay, two other things I want to test here. We'll start with the fan noise. This is at 100% load right here, and let's have a listen. And I would say the fan noise here is acceptable. It's about the same as it is on the Steam Deck, so no big deal either way. Next, let's do a sample of the audio from the speakers. And I will say they sound really loud and pretty clear, but the one thing I don't like about them is the placement of these two speakers. Now, I personally love front-facing speakers, but where they're located here on this device means that the meat of my palm right here near my thumb will actually cover it up depending on how I'm using the controls. And so what'll happen is you'll get this whooshing feeling as you move your hands back and forth, especially when you're playing a first-person shooter game. And so yeah, unfortunately, I find that actually to be kind of annoying. Okay, moving on to everybody's favorite part, let's talk about gameplay. We're gonna start with PC games and we'll start with the lower end games and move our way up. And when it comes down to these low end games, you know, you can play these at 1080p with a five watt TDP and they're gonna run great. Now the TDP is configurable down to three watts, but I found that at three watts, things get a little bit wonky. And so if anything, I would say four watts is the lowest that I'm comfortable going. But all the same, any sort of indie game is gonna play just fine at a four or a five watt TDP. Now I'm not gonna spend a ton of time doing game testing on this because I've tested the 6800U chipset on like four or five different devices at this point. And so if you're new to this chip and you wanna see what it's capable of, I would recommend checking out some of those other videos like the iNeo 2, the iNeo Geek, or any of the One X players that I've done as well. However, in a nutshell, I would say that one of my favorite things about this chip is that it can play just about everything as long as you dial in the settings correctly. And so for some of the older games, you know, something like Halo Reach, you can play this at a 10 watt TDP if you're willing to go down to a 720p resolution. But even then, it's really hard to see a difference between 720p and 1080p on a small display like this, and either of them look really good. And at a 10 watt TDP to get a lock 60 frames per second on this game is pretty awesome. Now there are a couple other neat things about this display. Number one, it already has support for a 40 hertz refresh rate. And this screen is also naturally landscape, which means that you don't have to flip it in the software like all the other handheld devices have to do. Now when you play games at 40 hertz, it's gonna be a lot less demanding than 60, and it's still gonna look very smooth, a lot better than 30 as well. And if you're willing to do a combination of 720p plus that 40 hertz refresh rate, you can play games in a much lower TDP as well. And so even for games that are somewhat demanding, like Resident Evil 3, you can actually play this at a 12 watt TDP with 40 hertz and 720p graphics, and it looks really good. Same thing with something like Doom Eternal. If we're willing to go to 40 hertz, we can get 15 watts and get some really smooth gameplay. Now, of course, you can always crank that up to 1080p or 60 frames per second, but you are gonna have to adjust the TDP accordingly. But personally, I found that on a smaller device like this, where I can't really tell the difference between 1080p and 720, I usually stick to the 720. And it is really nice to have that native 40 hertz within the panel itself. It just makes things very easy. And so what I typically will do is I'll start up a game and I'll kind of guess at what the TDP is gonna have to be, and then I can adjust it using that hotkey anytime I want. And so for example, here with GTA 5 at 10 watts, it's working just fine. And so now what I can do is use the hotkey to modify this down from 10 watts to eight by pressing select and down twice. And admittedly, the hotkey is a little bit wonky. It sometimes won't work. You have to get the timing down just right, but it will give you a soft vibration when it kicks in, which is really handy. Either way, as you can see here, I'm playing Grand Theft Auto 5 here at 720p in normal settings, but at an eight watt TDP. And I did some pretty thorough battery testing. We'll get into that at the end of the video, but at this setting right here with eight watts, 40 Hertz for the display and 720p normal settings, I was able to get over three hours of battery life from this little PC. That's it's kind of amazing. 
Now, of course, depending on how much battery life and time you have to actually play these games, you can actually just crank things up a little bit higher and get much better results too. And so for example, here with Bioshock Infinite, I kept it at 1080p with high settings and I did have to crank it up to a 15 watt TDP, but with those settings, the game plays really well. And so obviously this is gonna have less battery life than the eight watt TDP in GTA 5. But if you only have an hour or two to kill before you're actually gonna plug it in again, this will work out just fine. And so that's what I really like about this chip is the versatility. You can play it at very low power and actually get some really good gameplay. But if you need to, you can crank it up as well. And in some games you do have to crank it up to actually get some good gameplay. Play. For example, with Marvel Spider-Man here, 720p in low settings, but I have to use a 20 watt TDP to get an average of about 35 frames per second. And honestly, I think that 20 watt TDP for me is about the max that I'm comfortable going. Even though it will go up to a 28 watt TDP, it gets a lot hotter after 20 watts. And so the device is going to get noticeably warmer. I wouldn't say it's hot or anything, but it definitely does get warm at 20 watts and above. And honestly, sometimes cranking up the TDP is just going to give you diminishing returns. For example, here with Spider-Man, same settings here, but if I crank it up all the way up to 28 watts, I only still get about maybe 37 frames per second. And so here I am increasing the wattage by about 40%, but only getting an additional two frames per second. To me, that's just not worth it. And so like I said, it's all about balance and it really depends on which game you're going to try. Now, in addition to playing PC games from your Steam library, there are some advantages of having a Windows-based handheld like this too. For example, you could download and install games from Game Pass or from the Epic Game Store, or GOG, any of those other options. Or you could always just run standalone EXE files. For example, you have Mario 64, the PC port here just runs really well. Or of course you could grab some third party or fan games that are out there like Pokemon Infinite Fusion. Suffice to say there are lots of options when it comes to PC gaming and it's not just playing your Steam library. And so if you have a large library somewhere else, this might be a good incentive for you to try out something like this. Now, when it comes to retro gaming, you have many different ways to skin that cat as well, but one of the new options that's coming out here soon is actually EmuDeck for Windows. And if you watched any of my previous Steam Deck or EmuDeck videos, you know that I really love this configuration system. Essentially what it does is it downloads and installs specific emulators that are gonna work really well on your machine. And then it also pre-configures all the settings for you so you don't have to spend a lot of time learning how each of these emulators work. Additionally, the Windows version of EmuDeck is gonna have some neat features. For example, you can set the internal resolutions for each of your systems while you're installing them. And so for example, you can have 1080p for GameCube and Wii and PS2, but then you can also keep it at the native 720p resolution for PS3 and Switch. Now the Windows version of EmuDeck is still in trial phase right now. It's actually a beta release available for patrons. And so if you wanna try it out, then I would recommend checking out the EmuDeck patron page and maybe signing up so you can get access. But as it stands right now, for all the emulation testing that I did in this video, I actually used EmuDeck for Windows to do all that configuration. And the cool thing here is it integrates with Steam ROM Manager for Windows, which means that you can have everything show up in your Steam library if you'd like as well. Now, when it came to actual emulation testing itself, as you can imagine, the first thing I wanted to test was the PSP. And of course it plays well, but I just wanted to see how it felt in the hands. And as expected, it's pretty awesome. Here I'm running at a five watt TDP, but upscaling it to a 4X resolution or 1080p. And all these games are playing really well. And there's something about the nostalgia of playing something in this PSP form factor while also playing PSP games. Now granted, it's a much thicker experience than actually holding a PSP, but all the same, it was really fun. Now I'm really just gonna focus on some of those high-end systems, so we'll go on PS2 next. For this one, I found that between 12 and 15 watts worked the best for me. And again, this is at a 1080p resolution, so a 3x resolution for PS2. But as you can see here, if you toggle between 12 and 15 watts, then you'll probably find the sweet spot for whatever game you try. I've also found that those settings work the best for Nintendo GameCube as well, something between 12 and 15 watts, again at 1080p or a 3x resolution. And of course, this was no surprise to me, just given the fact that I've tested this chipset on several other different devices, and it was about the same for all those too. Now, moving up to Wii U, I did do something unique here, in that I actually set the screen resolution to 720p before I even got started. Given the fact that most Wii U games run at a native 720p, I just figured I wouldn't want to push extra pixels to the display, so let's just lower the resolution altogether. And that had a nice benefit of basically making every single game run at a 12 watt TDP really well. And so as you can see here, the whole gamut of Wii U games actually runs at a 12 watt TDP with a pretty stable frame rate of 60. The only one I had to physically adjust was Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild. For this, I turned the screen to 40 hertz and then also gave it a 40 frames per second cap within the software. 
But I was surprised to find that after I made those two adjustments, I still was able to play the game at a full frame rate at a 12 watt TDP. And as we'll discuss more in detail when we get to the battery testing section, at about a 12 watt TDP you can expect a little bit less than two and a half hours of gameplay. And finally on the Windows side, the last system I wanted to test was the Nintendo Switch. For this one I found that about 18 watts was a sweet spot for most games. Now to get the best performance here, I usually would play these games in handheld mode just because again on a 6 inch screen you can't really see the difference between 720p and 1080p. And so in handheld mode it's usually going to default to 720p and it looks just fine. And so I would say for most Nintendo Switch games, all the way up to Super Mario Odyssey, you can play it at an 18 watt TDP in handheld mode and most of these games are going to play at a full frame rate. You might get some dips here and there, especially as the shaders are caching, but overall a really good experience. Now if you want, you can always crank up that experience if you want to have something that's a little bit better than the native Nintendo Switch. For example, here I'm playing Mario Kart 8 Deluxe in docked mode. So that means it's going to output to a 1080p resolution and it looks super sharp, but it is going to demand a lot more power. And so just to be safe here, I cranked it up to a 28 watt TDP so I could get some very smooth gameplay. I don't think a full 28 watts is necessary, I think 25 would have been about fine, but I just wanted to kind of show this off. And so my recommendation here would be that if you really want to crank it up like this, then expect only about an hour and a half of gameplay, and then also maybe just have it near a wall charger so you can plug it in and play that way instead. And like I mentioned before, you know, anytime you go over a 20 watt TDP, I would expect it to get fairly warm in the hands as well, which is not a very pleasant experience either. Okay, and a couple other things I wanted to test before we get into battery life testing was I wanted to see whether or not it worked with Botocera. Now this is a custom Linux operating system that you can run from a flash drive like I am right here, or you could also run it from an SD card. And the nice thing about this setup is that everything is contained within that storage medium. So you'll have your emulators, your ROMs, and all the settings and everything configured within that. And so if you wanted to keep your Windows side very clean with only PC games, or maybe you wanted to use it as a work computer, you could do that. And then you can have all of your retro games hosted on a flash drive or an SD card and then access them that way instead. Either way, it's a really nice experience if you want to kind of separate your retro from your PC gaming like this. And finally, another thing I wanted to test here was the ability to dock this device. Now, I don't have the GPD dock, but I have the INEO multi-dock right here. And so I have this set up to connect to my 8-bit DOE 2.4 gigahertz wireless controller, as well as the monitor as soon as I plug it in. And so just like that, I can plug in my GPD Win 4 into the dock here, grab my controller, and start gaming immediately. And this would be really neat if you had a dock hooked up to a TV. And of course, there are plenty of other implications here. Now, right now, I'm just showing a mirror of my screen from the Win 4 to the monitor, but I could also set it up as an extended display. And so if you wanted, you could have the dock hooked up like this, and with the keyboard and mouse, you can basically make it your primary computer as well. And that's one of those things that's kind of neat, you know? It's a handheld PC, and yes, it's quite expensive at the $800 starting spot, but it also can work as your primary PC, too. And like we talked about before, that USB 4 port on the top will allow you to hook up an external GPU, so if you wanted to do some serious gaming with this too, you could do that. Either way, I found that the GPD Win 4 works really well when docked too. Okay, and finally, let's get to that battery life testing I've been teasing for this whole video. To start, I didn't deliberately measure how long it takes to actually charge from 0 to 100, but if I had to make an educated guess just based on the amount of charging and testing that I did over the past week with a 65 watt charger, it took about an hour and 45 minutes to charge it all the way. And so I would expect anywhere in the region of an hour and a half or two hours to charge this device from scratch. Now when it came to putting the device into sleep mode and letting it sit overnight, I saw that it lost about 3% battery life. Now moving over to actual game testing, we're going to go left to right, starting with our worst case scenario. So this was me playing Marvel Spider-Man at a 28 watt TDP and not really caring about any of the settings, just trying to crank it as much as I could. And as you can see here, I got less than an hour and a half, about one hour and 18 minutes altogether. Now that's not the worst I've seen with this chipset. In fact, the One X Player Mini Pro was probably the worst that I've seen and that got 58 minutes at a 28 watt TDP. And so despite being a device that is quite a bit smaller than the One X Player Mini Pro, we still got an additional 20 minutes of battery life. Now again, this is a worst case scenario. I wouldn't actually want to play it at a 28 watt TDP anyway. For me personally, I found that the lower watt TDPs and adjusting the settings works out the best for me. And so that's what I did for the rest of these games. Moving down the line, we did Rise of the Tomb Raider, so a game that I would consider to be a former AAA title. And here I did adjust it down to a 720p in lower settings, as well as a 40 hertz refresh rate. But as you can see, with those settings, I was able to get a 12 watt TDP, and that gave me 2 hours and 22 minutes of battery life. 
And for me, that's pretty fair. Like I mentioned before, you know, a 12 watt TDP to be able to play like most Wii U titles and things like that, that's a good amount of time. Now at a 10 watt TDP, you can get even better battery life. You can get about two hours and 47 minutes. I tried this with Legend of Zelda Wind Waker HD on the Wii U, this using a 10 watt TDP, but the native 1080p resolution. Now, if we want to keep those settings, but try some maybe less demanding games like GTA 5, you can see here, we got it down to an eight watt TDP with an average frame rate of 40 frames per second. And that got us over three hours of gameplay with GTA 5. That's not great when it comes to just overall battery life in general, but for an x86 machine like this, that is pretty good. But I was really surprised to see how well it could do if you played an indie game and cranked all the settings down too. And so here we are with SteamWorld Dig 2. I did a 4 watt TDP and a 720p resolution. I also used an airplane mode here, so that means no Wi-Fi. And I also turned on battery saver and then knocked down the refresh rate to 40 frames per second. But as you can see here, I got a really impressive 6 hours and 27 minutes of battery life. And so again, that's the beauty of this chipset. You have the power to really dial in those settings if you want to get some good battery life, as long as you don't mind kind of tweaking it here and there. And the ability to make some fine tune adjustments with that motion assist app by using the shortcut makes it really handy too. Okay, we've done a lot of testing here, both on the hardware and software side. Let's get into the summary. We'll start with what I like. Number one, I love the compact size of the GPD Win 4. To me, this is a really good screen size and overall portable size right here. I feel like I can take it anywhere. The keyboard and mouse function initially felt like some sort of gimmick, but after about a couple days of testing, man, I fell in love. And so I really like that as well. I feel like it opens up a lot more convenient options when it comes to navigating through a Windows-based machine. Additionally, as we've seen throughout all the testing here, the performance on the 6800U chip is really good, and so I'm very happy with that too. Additionally, I really like the nostalgic design of the Win 4. It transports me right back to 2005 when I first got my PSP. And finally, I think it is priced pretty well. At $7.99 for that Indiegogo price, that's actually pretty reasonable. It's a shame that I didn't get a review unit any sooner because I would love to have made this review at the beginning of the campaign to give more people to decide whether or not to get it at that lower price point. As it stands right now, you know, if someone watches this even three days after I've released this video, they're going to have to contend with that higher price. But even then, at $950 with free shipping, that is somewhat reasonable considering this chipset. Now, of course, you can always get something cheaper if you get a laptop or a larger PC, but it's something this small with this amount of performance, you really can't find it anywhere else. It's really going to come down to whether or not you have a desire for something with that specific form factor and whether or not it's within your own personal budget. Now, of course, this device is not perfect, so let's talk about the things I don't like about it. And for me, there's only one buzzkill in this category, and that's the placement of the speakers. I would say that for at least half the games that I tried, this would come into play. Depending on how I actually placed my hands, they would cover it up a little bit and it would get this weird whooshing sound. And so as much as I like front-facing speakers, I don't like them here in the bottom like this. I'm also not a fan of the analog stick caps they used on the engineering units right here, so I hope they improve those, but if not, you can always use a third-party cap instead. Once I placed those on my device, I had no problems whatsoever. I'm also not a huge fan of the trigger feel here. I feel like they're just angled too sharply, and they're a little bit smaller than I would like too. And sadly, neither the analog sticks nor the triggers are hall sensor, which is kind of becoming the norm with a lot of these high-end handhelds. Next, I put down that, you know, this thing is thick and dense, and I personally like that, but I can understand why other people may not like it either. And so I think if that is a concern for you, you don't want something that's very heavy and dense, then this may not be a good fit. But for me, it works out really well. And finally, the last one here is it does get pretty warm when you get above 20 watt TDP. Again, it was never to the point where it was unpleasantly hot. For example, the Ioneo Air at a higher TDP definitely gets too hot for me, but this one, I didn't really feel that. Instead, I would say that it is noticeable, but not uncomfortable. And so at this point, you're probably wondering what I actually think about the GPD Win 4 and whether or not I recommend it for others. And as you may know, I've tested a lot of these handheld PCs over the past year and a half. And as far as Windows handheld PCs go, I've been kind of lukewarm about many of them. But I have to say, and I don't say this lightly, this is my favorite among all the others that I've tested. In fact, it's so good that it's actually come to challenge the Steam Deck as my favorite handheld PC overall. And everyone loves the Steam Deck, and I do too, but the thing is here that I think there's a use case for the GPD Win 4. And so let's do a quick recap real quick because there are reasons to get one over the other. To start, I think that if you're in the market for a handheld PC and you want something super comfortable at a lower price, then I think the Steam Deck is a better bet. 
In addition, there are a ton of people with Steam Decks, which means it has a huge fan base, which means that if you ever run into issues, you will likely find somebody who's had that same issue and you may find the solution online too. And so I think if these are priorities for you, then the Steam Deck's going to be a better fit. Now, there are going to be some shortcomings that come with getting a Steam Deck. For example, it is a significantly large handheld, and there are some diminishing compatibility issues that come with using SteamOS. For example, there are specific Windows games or stores that just don't work with the Linux based SteamOS interface. Now there are workarounds, for example you could install Windows, but if you are expecting to be able to play every single game on a Steam Deck without having to get into the nitty gritty of the tweaks, then you're probably not going to have a good time. And so those are the positives and negatives with the Steam Deck, and let's do the same with the GPD Win 4. The advantages here is that it comes in a much smaller form factor, it's about half the size of a Steam Deck. On top of that, we have a native Windows PC experience here, and so if you are comfortable with Windows, you'll be right at home from day one. This means that every PC game that'll play on Windows will play on this machine, and if you want to use this as a primary Windows PC, you know, hook it up to a dock and a monitor, then that'll work out really well too. Additionally, if you want a chip with the very best performance right now, it's going to be this one. The Ryzen 7 6800U outperforms the Steam Deck by about 25-30%. But of course, you have to be willing to live with the shortcomings of this device too. For starters, it has a higher price point, $799 right now. But after it goes to retail, GPD says they're going to charge $950 for the base model. And so that's a pretty significant disadvantage right there. It's about twice the price, if not more, of the base Steam Deck model. And additionally, you have to be willing to live with the density and thickness of this device. Now, I personally like it, but I recognize that there are going to be other people out there who do not like the feel of this device. And so if the idea of having a handheld that's kind of comparable to a brick doesn't appeal to you, then this might not appeal to you at all. And so wrapping things up here, I guess the best demonstration I can do of how I feel about the GPD Win 4 is actually show the proof in the pudding. And that is that last night I actually sat down and I dropped the $795 to buy the GPD Win 4 for myself. There were a couple reasons for that. Number one, I wanted to make sure I got that Indiegogo price because I think that's a really fair deal. And I was also really happy to find that they had free shipping anywhere in the US, including to Hawaii. And I think that for a reviewer like me who already has a bunch of these review units sitting at home, the fact that I'm willing to drop $800 of my own money to have this machine says a lot. In fact, tomorrow I'm going to drop a video about this exact topic. Because I don't consider myself to be the target audience for these high-end handheld PCs. For me personally, I prefer to get something a lot cheaper, and I think that anything over like two or three hundred dollars becomes an investment. And so the fact that I was willing to invest this much of my own money into the GPD Win 4 to me says a lot, and so that's what we'll discuss tomorrow. But of course, this channel is not about me, it's about you. And so in the end of the day, do I recommend the GPD Win 4? And I guess it comes down to this. One, are you in the market for a handheld PC, and are you willing to spend this much money for what you're going to get. And if you are, and you're weighing between, you know, something like the iNeo 2 or the One X Player or any of the other handheld PCs that use this chipset, for me personally, I found that the Win 4 is the one that checks off the most blocks. And so because of that, yes, I definitely recommend this device. Some of the other handheld PCs out there are still really good, especially that iNeo 2, which is probably my second favorite among the Windows PCs. But as it stands, I'm happy to say that the GPD Win 4 is the king for me right now. And it's going to take a lot to dethrone this one, and so I'm looking forward to the other handhelds coming out in the future. As always, thank you for watching, and be sure to like and subscribe if you found this helpful, and we will see you next time. Happy gaming.